Hello, and welcome to A Gross of Physics. Today is day 93, and what I'd like to discuss is refraction again, but have a quantitative measurement of refraction. Now, first of all, remember, refraction is when a wave enters a new material and changes speed. It can either speed up or slow down. In the case of light, the more dense the material is, the slower light will travel. The less dense, the faster light will travel. And remember, since light can travel through the vacuum of space, the speed of light in a vacuum is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And we denote that with the letter C. Now, in order to figure out a ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to a speed of light in a material, we have what we call the index of refraction. It tells us how much faster light travels in a more dense material, or I'm sorry, how much slower light travels in a more dense material. And there's a simple equation in order to calculate that. And it's n equals c over v. n is what we call the index of refraction. c is the speed of light in a vacuum, and v is the speed of light in the material. If you think about it, the two speeds have the same unit, so they're going to cancel out. So the index of refraction is going to have a non-unit. So it's going to just be a number. That being said, the values that we'll get is if we have um, the speed of light in a vacuum and we're traveling in a vacuum, C will be the same as V. So if you divide the number by itself, you end up with 1. So the base value for the index of refraction is 1. And that's when an object travels in a vacuum. If it travels in a more dense material, it will slow down. So the speed will always be smaller for V um, than it is for C in any other material than if it's equal to it. So what happens is as V goes down, the index of refraction will go up because C is a constant. There's an indirect relationship between the speed of light in the material and the index of refraction. So bigger indices of refraction mean slower speeds. And what we can do is uh, realize that any value for N is going to be greater than or equal to 1. So we can't have a number less than 1. Um, and theoretically, we could have a value as big as we, we want. For our purposes, we can look for a number of index of refraction values on the reference table. And that will give us a set of values for, um, for different materials. Now, when we have that, you'll note at the top, it does say that the frequency is 5.09 times 10 to the 14 hertz. And that is yellow light. Later on, we'll talk about another part of the reference table where it gives us the colors of light. What that means is that these indices of refraction are only true for yellow light. And when we talk a little bit later about dispersion, we'll see that different colors of light travel at different speeds in different materials. So for yellow light, which is just about the center of our um, visible light spectrum, we have these sets of values. And it lists a number of values from air to corn oil to diamond to ethyl alcohol, um, all the way down to water and zircon. Now, each one of these is given a value. And you'll notice from the chart that air is 1, and water is 1.33. That's a number that we're going to use quite often. Um, lucite, which is a type of plastic, is 1.5. And corn oil, 1.47. The biggest value on our chart is diamond. And that means that diamond is going to have light travel the slowest. It's also going to mean uh, why it's going to be a reason that, l that light has special characteristics in diamond and why diamond is so special. But for our purposes now, if you were given a set of uh, materials and you ordered them from lowest to highest index of refraction, that would show the order of opposite for speeds. So the one that had a 1, which is vacuum, would have the fastest speed and we'd move down all the way to diamond, and that would have the slowest speed. You could actually figure out the speed of light in those materials. You plug in N for N. So for example, for a diamond, it'd be 2.42. That would equal C over V. C is always 3 times 10 to the 8, and you can calculate V from that. If we knew what the speed was in a certain material, we could divide that into C and actually come up with an index of refraction value. Remember, though, if you get a number that's less than 1, you probably did something wrong. And you might want to check your work because you probably inverted the C and the V. But we do have a chart on a reference table, and that will give us values that allow us to determine what, the val uh, what, what this index of refraction is for different materials. Remember, though, that's only for yellow light. So most assessment questions will say that the frequency is 5.09 times 10 to the 14 because that's what the chart gives us. 
Now, to get a very um, precise value for how much light turns when it goes into a new material, we have what we call Snell's Law. And Snell's Law is a geometric relationship between the angles of incidence and the angles of refraction compared to the index of refractions. And Villebrand Snell came up with this relationship, um, which we now call Snell's Law. We're always going to measure the angle of incidence and refraction, theta, usually theta i and theta r, or theta 1 and theta 2, because we don't want to get confused with theta r being reflection. Um, so theta 1 will be the angle of incidence, and theta 2 will typically be the angle of refraction. And what we have is this um, equation that, like I said, is um, discovered, was discovered by Villebrand Snell. Now, an interesting side note to this is that Rene Descartes actually came up with the same relationship. And for many years, he got credit for coming up with what we now call Snell's Law. It was Descartes' Law. Um, the reason being is he, when he found this information out, he published it. Snell never did. So in 1621, Snell came up with what we call Snell's Law, this relationship between the index of refraction and the angles of incidence and refraction. In 1637, Descartes did and he published it. So he was the first to publish, so he was the one who got credit for coming up with this law. Posthumously, after Snell uh, had died, they found his work and predated it to before Descartes. So Snell uh, actually got credit for this discovery um, after his death. So it's important that if you do discover something, you don't just hold on to it and you let other people know. You publish it in a scientific journal, um, and make sure that your findings are, um, are recognized by you um, so that the community of scientists can realize the hard work that you put in. So when you come up with a discovery, don't just put it in your basement in your notebook. Make sure that you publish it in a scientific journal. So number one, you get credit. Number two, other scientists can determine whether or not it's a valid um, law or, or theory at that point. Now on to the actual law. The formula is stated as the following, n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. n1 is the index of refraction of the first substance, sometimes air, sometimes water, wherever the light starts. Theta 1 is the index of, or the angle of incidence, so what angle it hits the boundary. n2 is the index of refraction of the second material, so it could be air, it could be water, it could be wherever the light is going into. And theta 2 is the angle of uh, refraction. Typically, we're going to want to determine whether or not the angle is bigger or smaller with our less, more, less, and more, less, more, and see if we get our answers correct. Now, we could take the index of refraction equation, the law of refla uh, refraction, Snell's law, and we can combine it with um, n equals c over v, and we can even combine it with v equals f lambda to come up with a big uh, equation that, that, that relates all the speeds the wavelengths, and the index of refraction values, as well as the angles. Now remember, it's sine theta, so if you have to find theta, you may have to find the inverse sine of your answer as well. So when you get a 0.5, um, that may be a choice on an assessment, but you should do the inverse sine of that to get the angle in degrees. This is another example of us being in degrees. Now if we take the Snell's Law, n equals c over v, and v equals f lambda, and combine them, we end up with this large equation that looks like the following. Sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals v1 over v2 equals lambda 1 over lambda 2 equals n2 over n1. Now you'll note, everything is 1 over 2 except n. The other thing you'll note is that frequency is not part of this equation. And that's because the frequency of light, even when it turns, does not change. So when light slows down or speeds up, the one thing that stays the same is the frequency. When we're talking about light and we're talking about frequency, we're talking about the color of the light. So the color of an object doesn't change just when you go into a swimming pool. So if you have a blue bathing suit on and you go in the water, it doesn't change colors all of a sudden. It stays blue. If you have a red bathing suit, it stays red. That's frequency. That's the color of the light. So the color stays the same although the speed and the wavelength will change. And what we can do is use either one of those equations, Snell's Law or the modified version of Snell's Law with all the different formulas mashed together um, to determine whatever unknown we may have in a problem. 
And what I'd like to do now is look at a couple of sample problems. We'll bring out the whiteboard and we'll solve a few sample problems dealing with Snell's Law. Remember, we always measure the angle with respect to the normal line. And the angles are in degrees. So if you're in radians in your calculator, you're going to have to switch over to degrees now. So let's take out the whiteboard and look at some sample problems now. Thank you. All right, we're going to bring out the laser again, and we're going to look at refraction once again. Now what I'm going to do is shine this laser along this line that I drew. And since there's nothing impeding its motion, you'll see that it travels in a straight line. And it will continue on as far as the whiteboard is. Now if I were to take a plastic container with water in it and do the same thing, you'll see that the light ray is actually changing direction. Instead of going straight, it's turning. What I'm going to do is mark that spot right here. Okay, so it's whoop, maybe it's up here. There we go. Now if I remove this, you'll see that it goes straight like that. But in fact, it's going to turn. So this is where it wanted to go. And when I put the water there, it's actually going to change direction like that. So the water is causing this to slow down. Now if I were to be completely perpendicular, it shouldn't make much difference in terms of where it hits on the barrier. So if I hold it perpendicular, it's still slowing down. And yes, we're getting some reflection. And you'll notice that definitively here, there is some light that's bouncing off here and going, according to the law of reflection, in this direction there. Now if I remove this, we'll be able to trace what the light ray wanted to do and then what the light ray actually did. I'll be able to show you that more definitively. This is the straight line. And it wanted to do this, and I guess I marked it. I don't think I held it that straight. And the reality is once it hit here, it turned. So this was the original ray. And then number two here was the refracted. Now once again, we're going to draw a perpendicular line and we'll be able to figure out quantitatively how that changes. Now if I were to measure this angle here, and then now this line disappears because it refracted, and this angle here, they're going to be different. And the amount of turn that we have, the amount of change in that angle, we'll be able to quantitatively determine how fast the light is traveling in this new material. And we're going to need to use something called the index of refraction in order to do that. Now the index of refraction is just a ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum, which is 3 times 10 to the 8, and the speed in the new material. Now every object has its own value for the index of refraction and some common ones are going to be in your reference table. For example, water is 1.33 and I know that. Now if I know the index is 1.33 and notice there's no unit because if I'm dividing meters per second and meters per second the units end up canceling out. I can find how fast the light is traveling in the water. And if I cross multiply and then divide, I get 3E8 divided by 1.33, and I get 2.25 times 10 to the, and I'm assuming it's going to be 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 meters per second. So sometimes you'll need to know how fast it travels and you might have to look on your reference table to determine that. Now that's the index of refraction, it's just a ratio. 
These numbers times 10 to the 8, they get cumbersome if you're dealing with light rays all the time. So this number is a lot more manageable. So we'll use the index of refraction instead of the actual speed in many cases because it is just a ratio between the vacuum of space and in the new material medium. Now let's look at another example of refraction. And this time we're going to refract the light through a glass prism. Now I have the shape outlined already. And you'll notice without any uh, material in the way, the laser is traveling a straight line through the center of the triangle. If I were to place this, let's put it this way so you'll be able to see the light ray. What will happen is you'll notice that it changes direction. You'll also notice a number of light rays are traveling. Now originally it was going straight through, so the light ray was traveling. I'll draw a simulated light ray here. Straight through there, I'll try to trace that with this. There we go, it's traveling straight through. I place the prism, and what's happening is it turns when it enters the prism. In fact, it's going to turn down here. So if I were to mark it, once again, I need more hands than I have. We have a situation where it goes to right there. And if I use the straight edge, you'll see that it turned. It wasn't a dramatic turn, but it turned. So the light ray tried to go straight like this. Oop. And then it turned. It, it turned down. Now when it hits that other side, let me get rid of all this stuff. When it hits the other side, you'll see that the light ray is escaping in this case. But we do have a number of light rays. Some of the light is reflecting in here. Some of the light ray is refracting. Some of it is escaping. And as I turn this, you'll notice that eventually we get to a point where this light ray here doesn't escape anymore. It's bending away from the normal as it tries to go into a faster medium because the glass is around 1.5 for the index. Air, so glass is 1.5. Air is 1. And as the light ray hits here, it's going to bend away from the normal because it's speeding up. Now eventually we get to a point where the maximum amount of refraction is 90 degrees. Well, then something very interesting happens. And we'll talk about that in another day or so. All right, for a quantitative approach, what we're look, going to look at is Snell's Law. And that will allow us to calculate the angles or the indices of refraction based on the angles. And the equation in its generic form is n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. And what we're going to do is typically look at a boundary problem that almost always looks like this basic setup. We draw arrows to represent the direction the problem's going. The first light ray we call theta 1. The refracted ray we call theta 2. That matches with N1 for the first medium and N2 for the second medium. So the N1 is here and sine theta 1 is there. N2 is there, sine theta 2 is there. Now we can also combine this with the index of refraction equation and V equals F lambda. And what happens is you end up getting a unified equation for this. And it ends up looking like this. Sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals V1 over V2 equals lambda 1 over lambda 2, which equals N2 over N1. And you'll notice that everything's 1 over 2 except the N. The N's our new term, and it's different. So I always star that so I remember. Now that relates the angles, the speeds, the wavelengths, and the index of refraction of the two materials. And you'll notice one variable is not included in this, and that's the frequency. And that's for a very specific reason. The frequency of a wave 
stays the same, remains the same when entering a new material. And I'm going to put medium to sound a little smarter. Now the way we can remember that is when we take the laser out and we shine the laser, we have a red laser here. Is it changing color inside the glass? No. When you go in a swimming pool, do your does your bathing suit change color? No. All that happens is the light rays coming from the bathing suit or the light rays going into this glass are changing speed. And if we change the angle, the angle will change with it. And the amount of change is based on the difference between the two media. So N1 would be air in this case, N2 would be glass. We could have a plastic prism. We could even have water. So if we had our water container, place that here, we would have N1 would be air, so here, and then N2 would be water, and we need to know the angle at which it approaches. You'll notice I'm always shining it on the flat side, and that's going to allow me to draw a normal line a lot easier. And in the lab, we would actually use a protractor to do that. But for here, this is the equation, and this is how we can use it. Now let's look at some sample problems and actually use this equation. All right, let's calculate something using Snell's Law. And what we'll look at now is we'll have a boundary between air and water. And the light ray will come in at 37 degrees. Well, the first thing we need to think about is will it go away or toward the normal? Now, light rays want to go straight like this. But when they hit a more dense material, less to more dense, the angle is less. So it's going to turn this way. Now that isn't important for using Snell's Law, but it is a good way to know whether or not your answer makes sense at the end. Now we have to look up our indices of refraction. So air is 1. I'm looking on my reference table. And water is 1.33. I don't expect you to have those memorized now, but as you use them more, you'll remember them. Air and water are pretty common. The equations n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. 1 sine of 37 degrees equals 1.33 sine theta 2. Well, let's calculate that. To use our calculator, we have sine 37 we have to be in degrees for this. We have 0 0.6018 divided by 1.33. You end up with 0 0.4525 equals sine theta 2. Now that's not our final answer because that's the sine of theta 2. What we need to do is divide by the sine on both sides and end up with the inverse sine of 0.4525 and that will get us theta 2. So on the calculator, you have to do second sign, second answer, and you should get 26.9 degrees. And the reason I wanted to know whether or not it was bigger or smaller is so that I could check to see that that answer made sense. So 27 is less than 37. I'm confident. Now, don't forget. If you don't do the inverse sign, this choice will be one of the choices on a state assessment. So watch out for that. Make sure you do the inverse sign. And also make sure you're in degrees. If you end up with a negative value after you take the signs, you're definitely in, in radians. So just watch out for that as well. All right, let's look at another problem where perhaps this would be from the sides. Let's draw it this way. And maybe we have a fish tank, and there's water on this side, and there's glass, and it's real thick. Okay, So this is going to be glass, and this is water. And what we're going to do is try to figure out what happens between the boundary of the glass and the water. Now, what direction should we go? Let's have the light ray try and escape the water. The light ray is going to go like this from towards the bottom of the fish tank 
it's going to hit the glass. Now glass, it depends on the glass, but I'm going to give it 1.5. And there are different types of glass, so different indices of refraction. I'm making this one up. You'd have to know the specific glass. For example, flint glass or crown glass. Um, and then water is 1.33. That's standard. Now we're going from less to more dense. So it's going to be smaller. The angle is going to get smaller. This right here, this right here. Now let's uh, assume the angle is 20 degrees, hitting the glass boundary, and we're going to calculate theta 2. N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. N1 is water, sine of 20 degrees, 1.5 sine theta 2. So 1.33 times the sine of 20 divided by 1.5, second sine, second answer, and I have 17.6 for theta 2. Now it's not as big a discrepancy between the original because the difference in density is not that great. So that's a reason why this only turns a little bit. Now if someone's observing over here, of course it would then refract into the air again. But in this case, if someone's standing over here and they extend this line that they see back, it's going to appear that whatever's um, they're viewing in the fish tank is actually more shallow than it really is. All right, here's a problem where we have diamond and the light rays in the diamond are trying to escape into water. We have our wedding ring under the surface of the water. We're trying to look at how sparkly it is in water. Uh, looking on the reference table, diamond is 2.42. Water is 1.33 again. Equation N1 sine theta 1, N2 sine theta 2. 2.42 sine of 15 degrees, 1.33 sine theta 2. Now, of course, you can solve for n's if you knew the angles originally. You could solve for any of the variables in the equation. 2.42 times the sine of 15 divided by 1.33. Second sine, second answer. I'm getting 28. 0.1 degrees. Bigger than 15, I'm confident. Now, as this turns away, every time I increase the angle, I go to 20, 25, 30, etc., that's going to make the angle bigger and bigger. Eventually, we're going to get a point where the angle of refraction is along the surface, 90 degrees. It cannot refract any more than 90 because otherwise it's back in the original surface. And when that happens, we no longer have refraction, we have a reflection. So let's talk about what happens in that special case next.